I was using it as a crutch. Of course I can't accomplish this because look at my upbringing. Of course I can't do this. Look at who my father was. So everybody in my family, drug dealers, they're in prison and they got shot. One of the things that I realized was I had the choice to define what had happened to me as a positive or a negative. And the more that I defined it as a negative, the weaker that made my ability, my options, my ability to be able to transform my own life, much less anybody else's, whether we we're being discriminated against for color, for gender, for sexual preference, for our upbringing, for our financial position in life. We have the ability to redefine that in a way that serves us. Now, the meaning that I give it is completely up to me. It's not up to who's president. It's not up to who I'm married to. It's, so I went back and redefined my origin story to say, thank God that man was my dad. He built a strong person. Everything that he tried to destroy in me, all he did was make it stronger. On today's show, I talk about how to turn your abusive past into a superpower that serves you and others with Jason Cisneros. Really, your story begins with your childhood. What was it really about your childhood that kind of uniquely set you up to kind of the remarkable experiences you've been able to have since then? Uh, it's a great question. And, and I want everybody listening to this to think about it, not from the perspective of my story, but the fact that we all have one, right? We all have a beginning. We all have had to go through hard things. We've all had to address those. And mine is maybe a little different than other people, but it just has my own hard things embedded in it. And I was adopted when I was six years old. I was adopted by a guy that was a, a really, really bad dude. Um, you know, broke my nose probably 17, 18 times. By the time I was 17, I started stepping in between him and my mom. He was very abusive to my mom. And uh, I'll never forget bro, the, the, the first time that I stepped in front of her and took a, a punch and it was probably three years later that I had one of those moments where you go, you know, I can kind of take this, where he hit me really hard, as hard as he could, and I didn't go down. I think I was nine years old, 10 years old. It was a really proud moment for me. Of course, I got my my ass whipped a little bit harder after <laughs> because I didn't go down. But that that continued. That was sort of the torture. We were in and out of cities. We moved around a lot. Um, he would hide what he was doing on the back end with dealing drugs and all the other stuff that he was doing with weird jobs. Like he would, he would be working at a boy's ranch as a counselor, right. In the middle of nowhere, we would move to a, a ranch in the middle of nowhere. It was just these weird things into the outside world. People really didn't see what was going on, uh, at home. My mom tried to leave a couple of times. I know that, that a lot of times, People that haven't been in domestic violence situations will say, well, why didn't she leave? She tried to leave a couple of times and he would hold my family, my grandma or her sister at gunpoint until we would come back. Um, he what, tried does to that, what does that, what does that, I mean, I, I grew up in a, I grew up in an abusive home and I'm willing to say that now I wasn't yeah. physically abused. I wasn't sexually abused, but I know it was an abusive home. Like we used to have these family meetings and I used to get in trouble if I told anyone about them because um, I realize now it was just an effort to try and control and make sure that no one on the outside knew what home life was really like. So we'd always have these family meetings that we weren't allowed to talk about. Um, but for yourself, what does that do to you as a young boy, as a young man? Well, I, I think that to your point, you know, one of the things that I was dealing with at the time was, why does it? Because I didn't know he was my adopted father until when I was 17. He went to prison for attempted murder of me and my mom. And my mom took me out to dinner uh, that night to sort of celebrate the fact that he was being excised out of our life. And she said, by the way, he's not your real dad. And I thought, well, why wouldn't you tell me that? Like that, that would have been helpful information. And she said, Jason, because you would have killed him. And you would be in prison, he'd be dead, and, and you would have to deal with that the rest of your life. And I thought, well, that, you know, that's, that's good parenting at a certain level. Because <laughs> the only reason I never lifted my hand to my adopted father was because he was my dad. You know, I took the beatings, but I didn't, I didn't ever fight back. But along the way, I can remember several times, you know, we, had, we would live in these weird homes. And one of them was, was uh, an older home and it had a lot of moths in it. 
and I hold this green plastic bowl above my head and with the bubbles in it to capture them. That was one of my jobs, you know, as a kid. And, you know, one time like my arms got really tired and I spilled some and he was always waiting with this fly swatter, right? The, the wire end of it to just hit me as hard as he could. If I, if I dropped water or if I couldn't hold my arms up or whatever it was. And I remember the thought process in my head was, you know, this, this guy's supposed to be my dad. Like this guy's supposed to love me, you know, and that built in me over time, this unconscious question, which everybody has, if you do a little investigation, um, it's called the primary question in psychology. And the primary question that I built up over that amount of time was how do I protect myself? Right. How do I protect myself? Because this guy who's supposed to is not doing it. You know, my family doesn't protect me. How do I protect myself? And that took on a, a life of its own and put me in a position where I never trusted anybody. And so, you know, there was a lot of great things that happened and a lot of, of terrible things. But to your point, it, it caused a lot of unnecessary thought processes that I think having a good family and good parenting really alleviates. I didn't realize, I didn't figure out how to be a good man, right? A good man. I didn't figure that out until I was probably early thirties. And, um, and that was because of mentors, you know, like you mentor what, people. What, what being a good man, what, what does that mean to you? Like, so not causing harm. So easing suffering in other people's life is, is the motto that I go by now. Hmm. Right. And, and so if you're easing suffering, then you have to conscious, make conscious decisions not to harm other people for selfish reasons. And before that, it was all about, you know, me and I've got to get mine and I got to protect myself and all those other kind of things. But I saw people like yourself that were successful in life that that what they did was they spent most of their life easing suffering for other people and looking at at situations, trying to alleviate that pain with whatever skill sets and resources that I had at my uh, fingertips. And so that was the tipping point of being a bad person is, you know, in my mind, is somebody who is constantly doing things for themselves. They don't care who they hurt and and flipping over into the people that were truly successful in life. And I don't mean just money. I mean, making an impact and having people around them that they loved and loved them back, uh, being a part of a community or a tribe that that was really focused on making a positive impact in the world. Um, you know, you can be as broke as a joke and still be somebody who's a good human being. Um, I've dealt with prisoners and in my work now, you know, prisoners and, and I'm, I work in the world of trafficking, as you know, uh, domestic violence, you know, and then feeding people. And you find that, that a lot of, a lot of times people really want to be good human beings, but they don't have that basis of a platform to be able to step on what does that mean? To, to have somebody ask the question that you just did is a father figure question to ask, right? What does it mean to be a good man? What does it good mean to be a good woman? What does it mean to be a good person in this world? And, and just thinking about that question, it alleviates so many other problems, second, third, fourth generation problems down the road. If you're focused on utilizing, becoming the best you you can be, for the purpose of serving other people. And so when you think back and, and you know, you kicked off by saying, this is a story you've told many times before, that may not even be the hardest thing that you've had to face. The, the thing in your rear view mirror that you just had to face last week might feel like the hardest thing you've had to face, but um, I can't help but always want to know people's origin stories because I think it, it forms so much of the story, the narrative, but also who we are the subconscious and the conscious, the way we react to situations, the, the things we've had to break through was that the hardest thing that you had to face or was there, was, were there others along the way? You know, this is the, we do hard things podcast. So we want to dig into those things. <laughs> exactly. No, um, no, it, it ha- I mean, there, so I'll, I'll jump forward and then I'll jump back to answer your question. But as I realized further on in my life that I was carrying around my abusive upbringing and all of that stuff, I was using it as a crutch. You know, of course I can't accomplish this because look at my upbringing, right? Of course I can't do this. Look at who my my father was. Look, just everybody in my, and not everybody, but a lot of my family members, drug dealers, they're in prison, they got shot, they got killed in, you know, in all of these things being criminals. And so when I 
started learning and started looking for information about how to be a better human being and how to be a better man, one of the things that I realized was I had the power inside of me to modify my beliefs that I had given things. In other words, I had the power of meaning. Viktor Frankl's book, right? Man's Search for Meaning was a big, like, blew my mind to understand that that one line in that book where he says, I am more free than my captors, right? So what that meant to me, and I get goosebumps every time I think about it, what that meant to me was I had the choice to define what had happened to me as a positive or a negative. And, and the more that I defined it as a negative, the, the weaker that made my ability, my options, my, my ability to be able to transform my own life, much less anybody else's, came down to me saying, I have the responsibility not just to forgive. Forgive is a powerful tool, but not only to forgive, but to redefine. And everybody watching you has that same exact power whether we, we are being discriminated against uh, for color, for gender, for sexual preference, for our upbringing, for our, our financial position in life, we have the ability to redefine that in a way that serves us. And so as I learned that lesson, that now the meaning that I give it is completely up to me. It's not up to who's president. It's not up to, you know, who's my boss. It's not up to who I'm married to. It's not up to any of those people. It's up to me to redefine that. So I went back and redefined my origin story to your point to say, thank God that man was my dad. Thank God he built a strong person. Everything that he tried to destroy in me, all he did was make it stronger. Right? I wouldn't be a warrior, you know, in the in the domestic violence world, my nickname is the shield, right? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have any of that strength. I wouldn't have any of that power. I wouldn't have any of that love. I wouldn't have any of that had he not tried to beat it out of me. Right. And if I hadn't had him as a, as my adopted father, I wouldn't have somebody to look at and say, I'm going to be as far completely opposite of that human being <laughs> as I could possibly be. Why do you, I've, I've always wondered, you know, like I've heard others ponder this, right? People grew up in the inner city. You can go into gangs, but some people, elevate themselves out and then can come back and help or, or elevate themselves out. People grow up with alcoholic parents. Some people swear that they will never drink alcohol. Some people grow up with overweight parents. They look at that and say, I don't want that. You grew up in a household with, you know, I mean, even just hearing it, but like people getting murdered and people getting shot and drugs and domestic violence and all of these things. And some people would just repeat that. And you chose the opposite. I mean, this is an unanswerable question, but Gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could figure out how to help those in all of those situations figure out that there's another side? Here's what I think is, and I had a great conversation with Tony Robbins since you brought him up. He's been a great mentor, became a friend and uh, over a period of time. And, and, and I had a great conversation with him. But here's one of my core beliefs is that embedded in, in almost all human beings, not all, right? It, not all, but it, I think embedded in each and every single human being that is born and draws their first breath, there is a passion to win. There is a desire to win. It's embedded in us, in our DNA. And so there's not, there's, you know, my girlfriend has on, on her computer, you'll never look into the eyes of of someone that God does not love. And it's, and I believe the same thing. You're never going to look into the eyes of someone who doesn't want better, who doesn't want to win, who doesn't want to achieve more, doesn't want to be more, doesn't want to be a good person, doesn't want to add value. You're never going to look into that set of eyes. So the idea of the content that you put out and the Tony Robbins of the world and all of the things that are out there is that it's out there. For that person when they go, you know what, I've had enough of yesterday and I'm going to do something different tomorrow. Now the, the information is available, right? This is, you're putting this out for free. This is content that people should pay, be paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for. But it's out there for that person who's looking, who's seeking. And your information, they may like the way you look, they may not, right? It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, we've got to do what we can and we can't take responsibility for everybody. That's a, that's a big mistake. We have to do what we can with what we have um, and be adopt this idea of being a happy warrior. Hmm. So take me to the moment where you decided to take responsibility for yourself. 
there's been several of those little moments, right? But but I think that as I look back, I think that that your decisions and your behaviors drive your results and and your belief systems. And so I had driven myself and made decisions that put me in a situation where I was homeless. And it happened, you know, gradually over time, all of a sudden I'm like, well, I don't have a place to stay. I've been evicted. I better go sleep on the beach tonight. And then three months later, I go, shit, I might <laughs> think I'm a, I'm a homeless person <laughs> at this point. And it was during that period of time where I drove myself to a place where I was like, I'm no good than anybody. I had those suicidal thoughts, literally went to a, to a, a cliff and had a gun in my hand and was ready to, to pull the trigger and end it. And I heard, How you know, I, I, um, this was so... Man, I, I've said 12 years for so long. I think it's been about 15 years now. It's been about 15 years ago. And and I, I've i heard, and this was before I became a Christian. There's I, God doesn't speak to me audibly on a consistent basis. But I was sitting on that 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 cliff that night, and I was getting ready to, to pull the trigger. And I heard audibly, not yet, not yet. And I, I mean, it was to the point where I turned around and I thought somebody was there. And again, I was like, well, that's just my imagination. Not yet. And, and that was a turning point because I thought, all right, not yet. Not yet. Now what? That's the next question. Well, not yet. You don't want me to pull the trigger out. I've always believed in God. And the next day I went to a homeless shelter and the uh, pastor, Timmy, who was running the shelter that day, handed me Tony Robbins book. And in that book, it was the shift that I was talking about earlier. It's in your moments of decision where your destiny is shaped, hmm. right? Big, thick ass book. You know, you know which one I'm talking about. And I got, that's the line. And it was, I was obsessing over it. It's in my moments of decision. Don't know, you know who my dad is? Don't you know we we're poor? Don't you know we we're this? Don't you know we we're that? Like it, fighting with myself about this concept. But when I really sunk in, it's in my moments of decision where my destiny is shaped, it's like, now I take, I take back that control. I say, you know what? It's up to me. And that was a big shift in my life where I started taking personal responsibility for my actions, for my belief, and for the, the steps that I was going to take forward. I'm, I'm curious because, you know, you, you, did, you did bring up a key moment. When you have that moment, so not yet, now what, right? I was talking to someone else the other day about finding your purpose Finding your purpose is one thing. Living your purpose is another, right? And especially when you have clarity. So in these moments where we have clarity, where you go, this relationship, I can't go on anymore. Or yeah. this business is failing and not going to work. Or I have to let fire this person. Or I have to change something. Like, gosh, those moments where you realize that you're not as good as you thought you were. Or that um, what you're doing isn't serving you or helping other people. That now what moment. That now what moment is the thing that stops people because they're too lazy, because they don't know what to do, because it seems too hard, because whatever. You've worked with tons of people. You've, you've helped people transition. You've helped tons of people transition through this. How, what is the secret sauce to being able to get through that now what moment and not just backslide to comfort, backslide to safety and what have you? It, it's funny because it took many years of, of development. It wasn't I didn't understand this at the moment, but if I could go back and have this conversation with myself, it would have sped everything. It would have been, it would have been the accelerator that, that I don't know where I'd be at this moment in time, but I now know, I know where I'm going to be five years, 10 years down the road now because of this one concept. Everybody is fighting a battle, whether you're running a business, whether you're in a relationship, whether it's your personal joy, your, your financial situation, your body, right? What The transformation you just went through. We are seeking this one word called freedom. Hmm. Freedom. Now, freedom is, is elusive. Now you say that and it's like a fortune cookie, right? Well, of course I want to be free, blah, blah, blah. But for each and every person who's listening to this, to you, to me, we have a different definition of what freedom means. And the challenge is, is that we are so embedded in, I've got to pay rent next month and I've got to make a car payment and I've got to, I'm, you know, one step away from being homeless. I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. I've got all of these things going on. That's distraction. 
because we haven't sat down and took the personal responsibility to say, my outcome is freedom. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? How much does it cost? Right? What do I look like? What are these, what is my relationship that I, the person that I'm going to be in a relationship with look like? This level of freedom is something, and this is, you know, my company, Anton J Global is, is a, a, one of the top 10 consulting companies now in the country. And one of the things that always blows me away is when we have this conversation, I was listening, you'll, you'll appreciate this because I think I saw you actually on this clubhouse room where uh, uh, Elon Musk was speaking. Did, were you in that? Were you listening to him when he spoke? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that blew me away about this concept of freedom was I'm listening and I'm listening in the background doing the other stuff. And I hear the guy interviewing him, asking this question. Well, we're all entrepreneurs that are listening and, you know, we're all wanting to run businesses and you're so radically successful. What are some of the things that you would suggest to us for us to be successful? And it wasn't reported on. This little segment wasn't reported on very much. But when he, he said it, he goes, you know, because he thinks about things, he thinks them through. He says, you know what? He goes, I really wouldn't suggest it for anyone. And I was like, what did he say? I'm like adjusting my headphones. I'm like, what did he say? And he, and he, and he goes, yeah, I wouldn't suggest this for anyone. He goes, because I have, there is no moment where I have my own time. Seven days a week, every minute is accounted for. And they're not nice to have meetings. They're not nice to have sessions. They're, if, I don't, if I'm not there and I'm not making a decision, it could affect thousands and thousands of lives. And I thought to myself, Elon Musk, one of the wealthiest, most world transforming human beings on the face of the planet, doesn't have freedom. He doesn't have freedom because he hasn't sat back and gone, okay, what does freedom look like to me? I guarantee you having some personal time would be a part of that equation, right? When is enough money, enough money, enough money is enough money. Whenever it's bought your freedom, right? To where you don't have to be anywhere, where you can choose who you work with, where you can do the things that you're passionate about. And to a point where now you can start to give back and that can be a resource to help free other people. Slaves can't free other people. It's a powerful moment. So when you ask that question, If people sat down and took some time away from everybody and said, here's what my freedom looks like, right? I want to have a house that's paid for. I want to be, you know, I'm going to project that I'm going to live to 120 years old. Um, I'm I'm going to need a car that I need to drive. I've got to have food and da, da, da. And then next to it, there's a dollar figure that exists. And then you go about instead of running your business, and this is just in the business context, you can, we can uh, extrapolate this across all uh, formats, but now you look at it and you go, okay, my business isn't so I can have a better, bigger house so that I can get love from the outside world. I'm not going to be driving that fancy Lamborghini to prove to everybody online that I'm a super stud and, and that I'm successful. I don't have to have this and I don't have to have that. All of these things, it takes a different perspective because now I'm buying my freedom. I'm not buying the acceptance of other human beings. It doesn't exist anyway. That's a fallacy. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares, right? Nobody genuinely cares. And the people who do care are the wrong people to have in your damn life. So if you sat down and you said, it's going to cost me a million bucks, I'm going to put that into an investment. It's going to spin off 10%. That means I'm going to be making $2,000 a week for the rest of my life. And can I live on that? If it's 4,000, you just up the number. Right. So many people can make a million dollars way faster than they understand, right? It's, it's so interesting because it's like, I think a lot of us flirt with greatness, but never hit it because we taste it and we want it and we take little steps towards it, but it takes that massive push. It takes that massive action and it takes the risk of looking like an idiot. And so it's like, I don't know what advice you have for people like me or for people like us, or even for yourself when you face it, because it's just that like, who does, who does this? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people have termed it 
the more you term something, the more you're excusing its its uh, existence. I hope you're not about to say imposter syndrome because I'm because yeah, I am tired syndrome. of hearing about imposter syndrome. Honestly, yeah, it, 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 but but here's the thing: like when people talk about imposter syndrome, and there's a lot of terms that we could go through because I actually in my comedy routine make fun of a lot of these things. And but but imposter syndrome is one of them. To where people say it and go, oh, it's imposter syndrome. And what it does is it releases pressure for us to perform because we go, no, I don't want to be an imposter. What? Yes, you do. I mean, because if, the, if you see anything beyond where you are today, you're not that person. You don't have those things. You don't look like that. You're not loving like that. You're not serving like that. You're a damn imposter. Mm-hmm. So everybody's an imposter if they have anything beyond what a vision for anything beyond what they are at this particular moment, right? I'm not what I see for myself in the future. So I believe everybody's an imposter that's striving for anything. And so it's good. It's good to understand. I'm not there yet. If I, if, if, if I was not acting in a way that I thought deserved and was going to pull that vision forward closer to me. If I'm not acting in a, in that way, and I think that the way I'm acting, the way that I believe, the way that I'm eating, the, the people that I'm surrounding myself, if I thought all of that shit was dialed in right now, I would take no steps forward. Of course, we're an imposter hmm. to the person that we're meant to become. Right. Not them yet. That's good. I can, yeah, because I can just imagine, you know, like, okay, so here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm making my move, right? I'm standing behind the curtain. I can feel the cold air. I can hear the crowd. It's unleashed the power within. There's 14,000 people there and, and they're announcing my name and I'm walking out onto stage. The first time that happens, I'm going to feel like an imposter no matter what, right? <laughs> like no matter how much you're prepared for until you've done it, what, like a hundred times, 200 times, you're probably going to, going to have some butterflies, right? But it doesn't mean that that you're not capable of stepping into that person that you're called to be in that moment, right? It doesn't mean that you don't belong there. Hmm. And that's the meaning that the incorrect meaning that people give to imposter syndrome. I've sat in rooms, brother, where I'm like, how in the hell did I get to this table? You know, I had a phone call with a buddy of mine that is one of my mentors and one of my dear friends, um, very successful guy. And I called him up after we had this particular meeting and I was in the room with, you know, one of the three wealthiest people on the face of the planet, one of the most influential political figures. And I'm sitting at the same table with a voice on a particular subject. And I called him afterwards and I said, I go, brother, I don't, what, what was I doing in that room? <laughs> like, why, why was, like, I, you know, I'm a common ex homeless guy. I've got a criminal record, like all of this stuff. Like, why was I there? And, and he just said in one very simple term, he goes, you belong there. You belong there. And, and then he goes, and I'm busy and I got to hang up the phone now and hung up on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you belong there. I got to go. Yeah, you belong there. That's why. And, and so when you reach these moments of, of time in your imposter syndrome journey, right? When you reach these moments in time, you go, of course I belong here because it's on the way to that. Of course I belong here. It's on my way to that. And, and be open to God's plan and, and the idea that you've been uniquely prepared for things that may not be a UPW stage, but they might be a Mark stage, right? That's twice the size of Tony Robbins, or maybe it's half the size with twice the the net worth, right? Or whatever it is, we have to be open to the idea that we're not Tony, you know, I'm not Tony Robbins and you're not Tony Robbins. We're Mark and Jason, you know what I mean? And there's, we can do that Tony can't and there's Tony does that we can't and shouldn't. Mm -hmm. We're here to uniquely impact this world because we have a unique fingerprint in the universe. 